both at the same time, unparalleled pessimism and optimism about the future. Hey, my name is Ben Charland, and you are listening to What on Earth is Going On. And that voice that you just heard was my guest this week, the very highly regarded Canadian economist, Professor Miles Korak from the City University of New York. Miles's work on income inequality and social mobility and how those two things are interconnected is having a major impact on economics, on social policy, on government policy, not only in the West, but all over the world. His research is critical for understanding, I think, what on earth is going on. But I really do think that Miles hit the nail on the head when he talks about our mix of pessimism and optimism. So I don't really want to talk about our conversation too much in advance. What I do want to do, though, is ask you the favor that I always do. If you like this show, please give it a rating on iTunes or Facebook or whatever podcast app that you use, and please spread the word about the show. Tell your friends, tell people on social media, and let me know what you think. You can email me at wogopodcast at gmail.com. That's W-O-E-G-O podcast at gmail.com, or go to the website, wogopodcast.com. Anyways, without further ado... Here is Dr. Miles Korak. All right, Miles Korak, welcome to the program. Hey, Ben, I'm glad to be here. Thanks so much for coming. I'm really excited to have this chat with you. Oh, it's it's totally an honor. I'm really uh, pleased to have this chat as well. So cool. Let her rip. So um, I'm going to get to the first question in a moment, but I wanted to preface it by by saying that your work, to me, anyways, is at the center of the conversation about social mobility, income inequality, and of course, you can even relate to poverty reduction, which those subjects to me are really at the core of what's going on in the world today. I think that if we're looking to what the causes are for, even if we're go going to the election of Donald Trump or Doug Ford in Ontario, um, the, the events that are occurring even in Saudi Arabia, in Russia, Poland, Hungary, I think we could look anywhere in the world and see income inequality as some kind of a factor in that. And it's been received in the academic area, and I think in the media too, that income inequality is growing. And your work has been tied in, in part to, say, the Great Gatsby Curve, which ties inequality with social mobility um, and how those two things are actually intertwined more than we thought they were. And this is going back to the Occupy Wall Street movement um, about seven years ago and how people were saying that the, the things that you start out in life with can actually cause you to be a certain kind of person later on. And one thing that I actually, and I know I'm talking a lot at the beginning here, but I'm just really excited about some of this stuff. One thing that I, I read in, that you've said is that if we know the skills of someone at the age of five, we will probably know to a good degree what their skills will be at the age of 14. And if we know where they are at 14, we're going to almost certainly know where they're going to end up in terms of math skills and therefore in terms of their position in society. 24, 34, 44, 54, and so on. So that is my framing for why I'm so exciting to, excited to talk to you. But I wanted to ask before we get to all that, and you can take this any way you like, Miles, what on earth is going on? What on earth is going on? <laughs> well, I, I appreciate your introduction. Um, I'd like to, to um, preface some of those comments and put them in context. Sure. Uh, maybe we can do that a little bit later. Cause you can do it now if you want. Okay, well, it's, it's a more nuanced view. I mean, academics sometimes move at a very slow pace. So the research I'm doing dates back to 1992. What on earth is going on was very different than mm. th there is now. Um, uh, and it's a sort of s academic research is a slow and persistent um, uh, chipping away at a significant uh, question, or at least what you perceive to be a, a significant question. Right. Times change, waves come, they go, and uh, sometimes some research is um, found to be particularly relevant for the times we're, we're in. So it's, it, 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 it's not like I'm at the center of everything. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm always where I've been, and things move, and sometimes it moves you into, right. uh, in, into, into a more active uh, role. Hmm. Um, the other thing is I'm, I'm part of a community, um, and so I, I look at uh, scholarship more like um, the metaphor I use is, is it's a conversation, all right? So I've done a lot of work, uh, a lot of research, but it's always been in conversation. And I don't, to tell you the truth, I don't really feel that I've done anything terribly uh, uh, innovative uh, because I sort of 
get so much support from mm. other great people that I think about and I'm, I'm in conversation with. Mm. So we're sort of all part of this sort of movement that moves forward. And sometimes the question is significant and sometimes things do play out and sometimes research does both inform and change mm -hmm. uh, uh, what's coming. The second thing I want to preface is, though, your comment about if I know something about you at age five, I can uh, tell um, whether you will graduate from high school at age 14. If I know where you are at 14, I'll know what your, your status in life is. Mm -hmm. Well, let's just sort of be careful. Ben, I don't know anything about you, all right? And and w the way we talk is more about uh, averages. And, uh, right, statistics. Uh, uh, and statistics. Yeah. So it is true that if you have a sense of an average population of where they are at, uh, let's say you, you took a bunch of children and divided them according to their... Um, parents' education levels, looked at those with the highest education levels and look, uh, looked at uh, those kids whose parents had the lowest education levels. Mm. As a group, we can make some predictions, but there's huge variation uh, around that. Sure. So we should always be cautious about that when we project things out to uh, communicating to a, uh, to a broader audience. Um, so let's just put all that aside and we can get, get back to that. Well, can I, ju I okay, sorry, I just wanted to comment on that really quickly because right, I, I, I appreciate that we're talking about statistics and, and I, in no way did I mean to say, like, if I know something about you, I should be able to predict your, predict your outcome. But what I'm, what I'm getting at is that is, is that what I think you get out when you're talking about, say, social mobility. So we know that in the United States, on average, um, a person's background and upbringing uh, is likely to give them a leg up more often than in Canada, and in Canada more often than, say, in Denmark or Norway. Totally agree. So that it's that, uh, on average, qualifier. I just want to make sure that your readers are right. aware of. Right. We have no prescriptions for any particular people mm -hmm. or uh, no comments on any particular situation. Right. But on average, this is how it's moving. And, that, and those averages mm -hmm. sort of reflect underlying laws uh, underlying forces, underlying drivers that social scientists are sort of groping mm -hmm. towards, always looking through sort of a, a foggy window mm -hmm. and hoping for better data and, 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 and better insights. Well, and, and I think not only underlying forces, but also the policies that are in, in play as well. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I saw a YouTube video of a lecture that you gave, I think it was in in Europe, in Luxembourg, I think. Um, and you were talking about, uh, before we decide what policies to implement, we need to know what the situation is. And someone asked, well, aren't the situation the result of policies that have been implemented? And you said, exactly. That's exactly the point that, you're, that we're getting at. But we need to be circumspect before we just start um, making big rash decisions or big rash assumptions about what the policies are or what they should be. Uh, totally correct. I totally agree with that. And I think the community of social scientists uh, I belong to are in that framing. I have a, a theoretical model. It helps guide my approach to data, uh, which in turn allows me to highlight if if I'm lucky, if I do it right, if we do it right, uh, causal forces. If we know those causal forces, then we can wonder about the capacity of policy to do something about it. Um, but behind that is, you know, whether we should do something about it. Right. We should change outcomes. And that's part of a broader political uh, discussion as well. So policy could be driven entirely by ideology and gut instincts. Mm. And we want to sort of... In, inform that, uh, inform that in a, in a constructive uh, way so mm -hmm. that policies that are implemented effectively, efficiently, efficiently, and sustainably hit the target that we want to reach as citizens. Right. There, there's so much into that, too, because, you know, um, for example, you can also use data and information to legitimize inaction. So, for example, if you say, well, look, the, the particular poverty line that we're going to use today says that poverty is at 5%, and declining. Therefore, we should do nothing about it. In fact, we should probably pull back from what government is doing because government is probably spending more than it's getting in terms of poverty reduction. But that's because you're looking at one particular statistic in one particular time. So there's a risk there too. Well, it's more than that. It's uh, <laughs> sometimes uh, people can twist and turn and suit the statistics for their own need. And you can always find a particular academic study that might reinforce your preconceived uh, right. uh, uh, notions. 
my belief is that there is a truth uh, out there, but as I suggest, you know, the window we look at is sometimes a bit foggy, mm. it's sometimes a bit scratched, but we have to, in that search and that looking for, be disciplined by a scientific method that, that keeps those ideological, uh, and we all have them, ideological blinders in, 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 in check. Right. So, Ben, what on earth is going on? Yeah, I was <laughs> just going to ask, because we're getting, yeah, what on earth, Miles, what on earth is going on? Come on. Unless you're asking me, I'm happy to answer. <laughs> uh, well, it's a, it's a great question. So, I, obviously, I'm going to, it's a conversation starter, so let me sort of start it from my point of view. What, uh, what on earth is going on? Um, unparalleled, both at the same time, unparalleled pessimism and optimism about the future. Hmm. Uh, that's what's going on. I think I'm going to use that as the clip, by the way. That was very, yeah, okay, sorry, go ahead. All right. Uh, well, y whatever you like. <laughs> um, and, sure. and inequality is wrapped up in that. I mean, if you're a young person today, my goodness, uh, the opportunities in front of young people today are just astounding, all right? Think about it, all right? Just think about it, all right? Um, uh, you know, people live in this world, and we were talking a little bit up about this on the walk mm -hmm. to the studio, about the role of the Internet and our cell phones. Like, isn't this astounding technology where I can regularly engage in a conversation and actually look at a colleague in Mumbai yeah. in, in, in real time? Um, and it's getting even better where that person might soon be a hologram yeah, that you can interact with. Well, and, yeah. You know, it's not going to stop, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and if you're part of that world, I mean, your life is more interesting, more secure, uh, and uh, probably you're going to set your children on a path that will even be even more rewarding and more enriching. Mm. But at the very same time, in the very same places, uh, you know, be it New York or, 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 or Toronto uh, or Saskatoon, people are living very different lives, all right? Um, lives that, you know, I think reasonably in some cases can certainly be described as just sort of ad subsistence, all right? Not engaged in community and no sense of progress, of hope for a better future. Mm. And these, these two worlds coexist, not separately, and they're interrelated. And I think sort of uh, it's on us to sort of understand those interrelationships and, and how to enhance uh, the security and the well-being and sort of the inclusiveness so that we all live in a more sustainable community down the road. So it's, it's just these sort of, um, what's going on? Uh, it's these two parallel worlds that sort of fascinate uh, me. I think there's another aspect, and, and, and correct me if you think differently, to the pessimistic side, which is that not only is there other these people in these other places um actually and uh, you know i'm going to quote stephen harper so um he has a new book out i haven't read it but there's an article that was an excerpt from the book and he talks about and he's actually quoting someone else who i can't remember he's talking about people who are the somewheres uh and the the anywheres the cosmopolitans and the the you know, deep in the soil rooted people and that the conflict that we're seeing between populism and maybe liberalism or even democracy and liberalism is, uh, as Yasha Munk, one of the, a scholar that has talked about this, is really between these two, these two groups of people. And on the people who are rooted in their nation, in their community, they may feel like that community is being taken away from them. It's kind of like what you just said. They may not be engaging with things because the local newspaper has gone by the wayside as a result of the media revolution. But there's another aspect to this that, that's important, which I think is that there's a view of the future that is pessimistic, and that affects my dealing with the present. So there's this idea in the American dream, quote-unquote, that and the Canadian dream too, the European dream, that if... I am raising a kid in 1970, my kid's going to be better off than me. If I'm raising a kid in 1990, my kid's going to probably be better off than me. But there's a perception, real or not, today that 
my children are not going to be as well off as I was on average. Maybe they're going to then maybe they're going to win the lottery. Maybe they're going to be in what Naomi Klein called the global green zone and they're going to make it into this utopian liberal society, but most people are going to be worse off than I am in my present circumstance. And more important than the reality of that is just the perception of that. And therefore, I'm going to if if I believe that that's true, I'm going to obviously question the institutions that are around me. I'm going to obviously believe that government is not working and business is not working and that economists are not seeing what's really going on in my community. Um, and, you know, people might even like to quote George Carlin, who said that the only reason they call it the American dream is because you have to be asleep to believe in it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, but, there, but I think that perception has force is what I'm trying to get at. Uh, that, that's totally fair, but perceptions are always rooted in some reality or, or, mm. or, or unreality. I can't speak to Mr. Harper's book. I, I haven't read it, although I, I did uh, read an extract in one of the uh, uh, national newspapers. But let me um, use your Carlin quote and your conversation to sort of segue uh, into some of the research I had done and, mm. and why, it's, uh, why it has resonance, I, I, I think. Um, so we just spoke about you know the importance of uh, averages, <laughs> mm. uh, but I think what I meant about that was uh, we're looking at statistical tendencies, not individual uh, prescriptions. Um, but let me use average in another way, in the way that you're using it. Um, there is another book that I draw your attention to that came out a few years ago with the totally apt title "Average is Over." <laughs> so uh, mm. n now you know we've got different stories for diff different groups, and you mentioned briefly I. I think it did, uh, the Great Gatsby Curve. Yeah. So let me just sort of explain that uh, Please, to yeah. you and to your reason, uh, uh, listeners and, and why that has gotten so much uh, resonance. And I, I like the um, totally apt uh, quotes you made about uh, perceptions of where your, our, our children will be, and particularly where we can imagine if our children will do, be doing better than we did at the same point in, in, in life. Mm -hmm. So that's one dimension of what, quote unquote, we call social mobility, is just how strong your family background is as a predictor of your outcomes as an adult. If we have very weak ties between parents and children, uh, in some sense, that might be a marker of equality of, oppor of opportunity. You know, it, there's, if you come from a rich family, there's no guarantee that you'll be rich. Uh, if you come mm -hmm. from a poor family, there's, there's no guarantee that you'll be living a, a life of poverty. All this mixing and mobility uh, means that everyone rises to a point in life that just sort of reflects their talents and, and, and their energies. But along with that, we sort of do expect growth overall. We do expect, mm -hmm. in a broad sense, uh, overall, most people to, to at least um, expect or hope that their children w will do better than, uh, than they have. We expect that today in 2018, 18 looking forward. Forward. Okay. And, and, um, uh, and looking back, uh, there, that, that certainly was a perception of parents in the 1950s and 60s and 70s that their children will do better, and many, many of them did. So what people have been doing is using you know, uh, new data, uh, very detailed uh, data from administrative sources, particularly uh, in the United States, that's tax-based data. Finally, using this wealth of resources that governments have in running their um, uh, programs, like the tax system, but also other programs, for analytical purposes. And in particular, your readers might want to go to... Um, uh, equalityofopportunity.org uh, and take a look at the work that a um, Harvard professor, Raj Chetty, is doing with American tax data. And he clearly documents this decline in the fraction of children who are economically doing better than their parents over the last uh, number of, of decades. So now, over the, well, uh, over the last half century or so, uh, so now the perception is that, it's more than the perception, uh, his findings are that only 50% of American children can expect uh, or have done better than their parents uh, 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 did when they were kids, all right? Mm. Uh, and, and so what, what social science has done is changed our perception of that American dream. Americans historically we're much more tolerant of inequality in the here and now because they thought with that inequality came mobility, all right? right. I might be down lower on the socioeconomic ladder, but I can work my way up. 
and my children can move up. So here is an example of good social science bringing a new fact to the table that in turn changes these perceptions. So just to, to say, are you saying that Americans believed or people believed that inequality is giving an incentive is that what is that the the benefit of inequality? Is it the incentivizing? Uh, there, it, it, that's part of the story, okay. cer certainly. But the fact that there is inequality means that there's opportunity. Right. It, it's, okay. So, so I can jump up to the, the tenth, the first uh, rung of the ladder. Right. 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 All right. And I did maybe a decade and a half or two decades ago a lot of this research already for Canada. Uh, and showing, in fact, more recently, even showing how this uh, this dream um, varies across the, uh, the country in, in, in small regions. What's new in terms of political discussion is the link between economic opportunity and inequality. Now that we have all these data, not just for Canada, uh, the U.S., but also for many European countries, and recently the World Bank uh, we uh, released a report from many of the countries of the world now, we have sort of summary measures of the degree of this social mobility, the degree to which parental background shadows into child's outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that shadow is light or very dark varies across countries. And if you rank countries uh, uh, in two dimensions, in one dimension, the level of inequality that existed about a generation ago, and if we're just talking about the rich countries, you would see that Denmark, Norway, Finland, about a generation ago, were countries that were relatively equal. Okay? If you um, look at the other end, the United Kingdom, Italy, the United States, about a generation ago, were relatively unequal. Right? And you know, Canada, Australia, Germany, somewhere in the middle. So rank countries according to that level of inequality, and then rank them in another di dimension, the degree of social mobility, mm -hmm. the extent to which parents' incomes I are related to the child's adult income. All right, Which are the most mobile countries? That is to say, where is that link loosest? The old American dream story would say it's loosest in the United States. Would have to be. More inequality, more mm. opportunity. In fact, it's just the opposite. Climbing up and down the social ladder it happens to a greater degree in more equal countries. And the United States find itself, finds itself at the other end of that spectrum. A highly unequal country a generation ago in which that inequality is more likely to be ossified across generations than it is in uh, Denmark, Finland, Norway. Canada is sort of a middle ground. Uh, middling levels of inequality, middling levels of, s of social mobility. And so it's this link between inequality and opportunity that has gotten the public policy community uh, quite engaged. Because think of it, if you're on the left, this relationship is really quite interesting because I can solve two problems with, uh, mm. w with, with, with one policy. Reduce inequality in the here and now, and not only according to my view or the, uh, the views of whoever espouses this, uh, <coughs> not only do you make uh, society in the here and now more just and, and so forth because inequality is lower, you make, it, you make it more mobile. You create equality of opportunity. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. All right? So, oh, now this is where we were sort of talking earlier about the importance of social science. Is it inequality per se that determines mobility? What types of inequality determine mobility? And what is the underlying driver of, uh, of that inequality that then feeds into mobility? And so that's sort of what the research community is trying to document and understand. Right. But at the political level, this notion that inequality and opportunity are inversely related sort of as you suggested, is very important in framing conversations, in changing the, uh, the image people have of themselves and their society. So it's really important for us to understand how inequality comes about, what role policy plays in that, uh, 
what we should do about it, and can we do anything about it? Mm -hmm. And so, you, like you said, you know, what's happening? The inequality is growing, and I wonder if in the next generation that's going to erode opportunity. Do you think it already has in countries like the United States, which have lower social mobility than we would perceive them to have according to the American dream? Do you think that's already happened? Th th again, that's a good question, subject to a, 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 a lot of debate, because we sort of shift the uh, comparison now from between countries to what's happening within a country. Right. And when people try to look at trends in the United States in, in, in social mobility, then uh, we're seeing different stories, all right? But I think the best research does show that as we moved into an era of higher inequality, that's been associated with less mobility. Right. But it's important to scratch the surface uh, 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 there. Uh, and what's driving that? One of the drivers, this is where we're talking about great opportunities and, 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 and great challenges for people. One of the drivers is um, what economists like to call technical change. <laughs> mm. But basically just think the computer revolution and how that has fundamentally changed the workforce. All right? Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, my first job was at McDonald's. All right? That was a labor-intensive restaurant. All right? You had, uh, you had a whole bank of servers in the front. Uh, you had a whole bank of people at different stations in the back making your shake, flipping your fry, toasting your burger. And then you had a whole bunch of other people out in the lobby cleaning up after you. Mm -hmm. All right. Now I go into a McDonald's as a customer. I go to a screen. I punch a couple of buttons and I walk to the one person at the counter, pay, and they hand me a bag. Mm -hmm. All right. So technology has got a certain labor saving bias to it, all right? And the question is, do your skills complement technology or are, are your skills a substitute for technology? Mm -hmm. So if you're in a routine job or we're in a routine job, and I don't care if that's sort of manual physical labor uh, working on the assembly line or if it's sort of cognitive work uh, uh, as a middle manager or as a sales uh, person, in a big department store, if you're just processing information or, or you're just doing something routine, you're competing against the mother of all revolutions. The price of computing has just fallen tremendously. And spreadsheets can do that kind of work. Right. Robots can do that kind of work. Mm -hmm. And what happens? your wages fall if you want to stay in that work. Those sectors don't grow as much. So the next cohort can't find uh, payment for those skills at the same rate their parents could, all right? On the other hand, if you're designing those robots, if those spreadsheets help you to become more creative, if they help you become a better manager, if they allow you to exercise your judgment, that's to say, if your work is sort of non-cognitive and relational, um, the things the computer can't do, at least yet, can't look you in the eye and have empathy with a customer, mm -hmm. can't use judgment in a delicate situation to know the rules shouldn't apply here because of this or that extenuating circumstances, then your salary's going to go up because th the computer has, has made you more productive. Mm -hmm. right? And so you're seeing, as a result, the splitting of the income distribution, polarized into a lower end and an upper end. And the United States is ground zero for this. It's happened more there than elsewhere. It's the leading edge. But ground zero in the other sense that that society always being more market driven has less institutions to buffer those forces. Right, right. So all countries, all rich countries and middle in income countries and poor countries are being faced by this computer shock. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that globalization has, has hypercharged it. Mm -hmm. All right. But the outcomes are very different. So in the United States, the fraction of income going to just 1% of the, uh, uh, the population has, is almost one-fifth. One-fifth of the workers in that society 
okay? I mean, 1% of the right. workers in that society take home 20% of all the income made. And that's getting more and more pronounced that's as getting, time goes forward. Yeah, it, it, it's got it's, it's to have a stopping point at some point. Sure. <laughs> and it does go up and down because sometimes that income translates um, uh, into holding um, stocks and bonds and others wealth, other wealth that are more sensitive to stock movements. Mm -hmm. So lately we've seen that share go down in the Great Recession, but right. then shoot back up. Well, and, and an anxiety that a lot of people have would be that the last time, you just said that there's got to be a stop to this. It's not going to go on forever. There will not be a point where 1% of people get 100% of all the wealth. I mean, or maybe, maybe that's some dystopia we can describe. But in history, we've seen where when societies become so unequal, there's a shift. There's a whether it's revolution or war, I mean, the crises of the first half of the 20th century, the two world wars and the Great Depression were a rebalancing in a way of many of these forces so that in the, in the well, I guess the first half of the second half, the third quarter of the 20th century was this great age of the, the Great Compression, uh, where at least in the Western world, um, inequality was compressed, but now it's going the other way. But I wanted to ask you about technological progress, which is such an important factor in what on earth is going on today. And I think you really hit the nail on the head in terms of describing how it's tied to inequality, because it's right in front of us. But I want to I want to ask you two things. First of all, <clears throat> the when we talk about technological innovation, um, we're talking about people getting uh, putting getting put out of work, for example, something that's gone for a long, long time in human history, going back to the Industrial Revolution, where if you were able to put a factory together with a bunch of people working on machines, you could produce cotton a heck of a lot pa uh, faster than the cottage industry that existed before. And people felt the anxiety that this would put everybody out of work. But of course, that's not what happened. In the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, you had mass migration to the cities and a lot of people getting a lot of money. Uh, and of course, you had a growing and burgeoning middle class at the time. Um, but at the same time, you had you had growing inequality along with everything else. But today we see technological innovation happening so quickly that it's almost impossible for someone who's, who's just getting into the work sector today to keep up with the change. So in the Industrial Revolution, if I'm being put out of work because I used to work in my home making cotton, well, I can learn to use a lathe in a, in a factory in the time that it will take for me to, to change. Society will not have moved on that much, but we're moving so quickly today that I think the anxiety that a lot of people feel, the ec economic anxiety, which some people translate into anxiety about multiculturalism, for example, maybe incorrectly, um, that this anxiety is based on the fact that I don't think I can keep up with this technological innovation. But I'm just going to ask you a second. Well, that was my first question is, what do you think of that, <laughs> I guess? But the, the second question is looking at it more broadly. Technological innovation has, has been in lockstep with human progress since the very beginning, whether it's the invention of fire, the use of stone tools, agriculture, the Industrial Revolution, military innovation, and so forth. It's been with us the whole time. But if innovation is tied to inequality, there, there, it, it isn't just been universal um, in terms of the dispersion. We've gone back and forth. So what are the causes that have caused, what are the causes that have made inequality compress and go out, even though technological in innovation has been more or less an arrow pointing one way? All right. Uh, that's cool. <laughs> I, li I, I like your characterization of that, that Great Depression and um, the role of wars in, in, in this. And I think that's a pretty accurate uh, compression. So um, you've obviously read Toma Piketty, Tomu's Piketty's book. I haven't uh, read it, but it, I've, I've read a lot about it. Okay, well, yeah, that, yeah okay. That, so that's the storyline. And again, your listeners can, can, uh, can look his website and his famous book, Capital, which came out in 2014. Mm -hmm. And he graphs this top 1% share. So like in the early 1900s, 1920s, you saw saw 1% of the population taking, roughly speaking, 20% uh, uh, of all income. And then uh, the two great wars just decimate uh, 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 the, uh, the capital and society. And then in the aftermath of the war, we build institutions that are more inclusive. Growth happens. It happens at an amazing uh, pace, but it's more broadly shared. Mm -hmm. And so that, um, that, uh, that level of inequality and the top 1% uh, share comes in around 8 9 uh, uh, percent for a long time until we hit uh, the late 70s, early 80s. Then it starts taking up. 
taking off. And so there's a big controversy about what's driving that. Mm -hmm. Technical change I is one of them. So yeah, yeah, technical change is always there. I'm not sure it's straight as an arrow. It comes in sort of fits and starts. Sure. Okay. Uh, and we're always re uh, adjusting to it. Uh, the pace of adjustment is important, and I'm not in a position to say whether it's more intense now or 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 or, or less than previously. But it's not either way. It's not at the pace that at which human beings live their live their lives. We all too have a certain capital embodied in us. It's called human capital, our our education, our skills, even our personality. All right, but we're different than physical capital because what 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 an uh, entrepreneur can do is w once technology uh, renders his physical capital obsolete, he can scrap it, write it off, and move on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can't scrap. Re, uh, and, and, and sell in some sort of resale market our human capital. Human beings are part of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, uh, and this is where economics is both um, insightful and less insightful. A lot of economic models sort of look at the longer run. Where will we be in this new equilibrium? We'll still have jobs. There'll be different jobs. We'll all be employed in the long run. But the trouble is people don't live in the long run. They live step by step, year to year, in the here and now, and they continually have to make transitions in their lives. So it's no comfort to me to be told in 30 or 40 years it'll all work out. Right. Because I'm living in the here and now. And, right. and, and that's important. It's important during the dawn of the Industrial Revolution as, as it is n now. And, and, and I thought what you said was very insightful because... Um, what policy has to address is not just the the state uh, uh, of I the income distribution at one point in time and where it'll be another point in time. Policy has to address the transition and the insecurities in that, and mm -hmm. and, and and the possible erosion in our belief that public institutions can respond to that in an in, a, in, a, in, a, in an important way. So that, I think, is the policy challenge, is ensuring that the growth that does happen, one, is inclusive, so that it becomes more like what happened in the 50s and 60s and 70s, that it lifts all boats. We, can't, we can only do that to a certain degree with taxes and transfers. Uh, I mean, after market outcomes are determined, we have to start understanding how those market outcomes um, uh, can be made more inclusive in and of themselves mm -hmm. before the state gets involved. <coughs> and that involves building institutions and policies uh, 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 around them. So the policy challenge is, in some measure, managing the transition. And, and this is, like you said, it's not going to stop. So the, the big wave of concern everybody now is, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, maybe that's being a little bit over, over, overdrawn. But um, these kinds of changes that have been ongoing are going to move further up the uh, skill distribution mm -hmm. as prediction becomes used more and uh, more, uh, more and more in society. But I, I just sort of want to relate this to the social mobility agenda just to get back mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. So if you've got this world of good firms and bad firms, incomes growing in one sector, stagnating in another that's insecure, um, how are the kids going to do? How do you get access to that good sector? How do you manage the transition? I think you have to work sort of at both ends uh, of it. Uh, the outcomes in the lower end can't be so extreme anymore. Mm -hmm. We have to worry about incomes and insurance uh, for people who are in um, more contingent uh, workplaces. It's going to occupy a lot of people. And how do we give them, how do we construct the institutions that they have just um, a more secure and reasonable lifestyle? Well, I think that, uh, I, I, and this is probably a very conservative argument, that the role of government is actually to, s to stand back and let the natural processes take place. So if you, as you just said, if there are good firms and bad firms and there are, there's a stagnating industry and there's a growing industry, people who are going to school right now are probably not going to take a degree that's going to help them run an iron foundry. Probably not, at least not in North America. They're probably not going to work or plan to work in the coal sector. Uh, but if you're going to be in some sector that's dealing with, um, say, uh, solar energy or more to the point where you're complementing the machines that we're building to do the work that's possible, naturally people are going to gravitate to those things. So a conservative would say, step back, let the natural processes take place. But that segues into my next question, which and, and, and feel free to smack this down as alarmist. 
Um, you and, and, and it may be, and I totally admit that, but I want to ask the question anyways. <clears throat> you said that um, the role of policy is to manage the transition that we're currently undergoing. Um, well, I said that that's one of the roles, sorry, one, one of the, the framings. Right, it's okay. not the only one, but... but right, okay. Yeah, okay. Right. yeah. so uh, is, there, is there another role for policy, which is to stave off catastrophe? So, I mean, we all can admit, or most of us can anyways, that climate change is real and that there's a, a need for policy to address climate change and a need to stave off the catastrophe that rampant climate change will bring and caused by emissions, caused by carbon dioxide. There's a role for that. But if we see inequality and social, social mobility as impending crises of the same magnitude, right? So in other words, if we're sitting here and it's 1913 and we can see the First World War coming around the corner or if we can see the Great Depression or the Second World War coming, is it incumbent upon us as citizens and as people who influence policy to stave off what we think might be coming as a result of growing inequality? Because if we, if we see policy as only managing the transition, then we may get to a point where 1% of people do get 100% of the income because that transition was managed so well. Do we instead need to, I, I don't want to say the word radical, but maybe that's what we're getting at. Maybe we're talking about, does policy have a role to be more radical, to stave off what history has told us will happen? Or are we be, am I being too alarmist in asking that? Or furthermore, are we being too presumptive? about what this transition may be. Because Thomas Piketty, for example, uh, has, has said that not only is um, inequality growing, but the, the rate at which you make money by having money is greater than you making money through your physical or mental labor. And if that just gets worse and worse and worse, then we are headed to either a crisis or a dystopia. Is there a role for us to stave that off, to prevent that, rather than just manage the transition to the brave new world. Yeah, we can have that conversation without uh, calling it uh, radical or, or alarm, uh, alarmist. Uh, I, I think to some measure we, we have the tools to do that, and we can proceed constructively but incrementally on, on what we know uh, works. Mm -hmm. um, so managing the transition is important. And I guess your point is, but it has to be more than that. And I, I, and I agree I, with yeah, that. Okay, yeah. okay, I totally agree with that. Uh, and the way you described it, um, each new generation coming on is being um, uh, skilled in, 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 with new tools and, and has new directions. And that's the easy way, easiest way to manage the transition. If it was slow enough, it sort of evolves. Uh, with, as each new, each new cohort comes on stream, it works in new areas. Um, but we still face people who are disrupted or have made wrong choices or things happen. So he, here's one role for policy. Um, we often think of the welfare straight, uh, state as a great insurance mechanism. And this is how William Beveridge imagined it in, in, in the Britain of the 1910s. Uh, uh, and there, uh, there was a concern around unemployment and unemployment insurance. All right? But think of the industrial structure at that time. Mm. You had a job, uh, you lost that job, and eventually you were rehired into the same type of job or with the same employer. So it was sort of like the business cycle, ups and downs. And you needed some income to get you between job A and job uh, uh, B. And we, we designed systems of unemployment insurance. Okay? Well, we still have this need for security now for insurance. But our, our welfare state is sort of tooled up to deal with this legacy problem, all right? Maybe we don't so much need unemployment insurance. Like, let's face it, if you want to get a job, there's a job out there, mm -hmm. okay? The question is, at what wage, all right? Maybe we don't need unemployment insurance. Maybe we need wage insurance, all mm. right? So if I've been a long time employee, think of the, you know, uh, someone working in an auto plant. Uh, I've got a lot of seniority. Uh, uh, probably a unionized job, got a reasonable standard of living. Uh, if I am permanently laid off from that job, I will never recover. I'll never go back to another job like it. Mm -hmm. And my income is going to take a permanent hit. All right? So you, we as a society are telling people, you're going to get shocked. Your income is going to go down 14, 15, 16, 17, 18% permanently. Good luck. Or we can say, 
I'm going to smooth that path for you. <laughs> right. right. And that's what wage insurance would do as opposed to unemployment insurance. Hmm. So this is just sort of like one way of sort of rethinking our traditional tools in a new surrounding. Okay. Um, I think uh, Canadians have done a really good job in terms of the other thing that we should be insured for, the length of life and pensions. So beefing up our collective uh, pension responsibilities through the Canada Pension Plan, for, for example, as this government did. That makes sense because individually we can't handle those risks and increasingly uh, we can't do it through defined benefit programs mm -hmm. with our employer. Employers can't handle that risk. So collectively we have to uh, uh, beef that up. So managing the transition uh, uh, appropriate training and skills are important in the longer run. They have to be there. We have to think about insurance and resilience. But then, as you were alluding to, uh, we have to think about the overall inequality of outcomes and make the end result more inclusive. All right? And I think that's particularly important because inequality will feed into uh, inequality in the next generation, mm. all right? Uh, Piketty shows us some mechanism that, that happens sort of at financial levels, but it happens in, in my research and in the community I belong to, even at micro levels. Well, if we've got a highly unequal society like the United States, then some fundamental institutions change. Like there's more now more diversity in the quality of primary and secondary schools if you finance uh, those schools by local property taxes, where the rich kids live in neighborhoods with really well endowed schools. All right, and then. Maybe choosing the right school is really important to getting into the right high school because the right mm -hmm. high school will get you into the right university. Which, of course, will lead you to the high good life. Yeah. 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 And, if you're, and, if, and if that becomes a path full of bottlenecks uh, and, and very few second chances, um, that's tougher. And inequality, if you just let those forces go, will push us in that direction. So we need a collective response for the the very fundamental building blocks of a person's life, health care and education, uh, have to be high quality for everybody. So at least you've got that, that, that opportunity to, to, to make something more. We have to continually build second chances into the system. So you dropped out. So this, in, uh, this degree didn't work out. But there's always a second chance to drop back in and, 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 and retrain for something uh, 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 else. So building a lot of second chances and not bottlenecks, mm -hmm. all right? Those are reasonable responses. And that's all has to do with sort of the investments, the capabilities, the opportunities we create. And we have to push back against market equality, inequality and give um, more space through public policy to families to be able to navigate that. Mm -hmm. But in the end, we have to be concerned with, uh, with, with, with the outcomes. <coughs> There's always a payoff in the end. Even if you've got the high skills, <laughs> how much do you get paid for them? Uh, and uh, th uh, there I'm a little bit lost at, at, pol uh, at, at policies. And, and, I, and I think there is some discussion, uh, really creative discussion that I'm not an expert in um, uh, that's going on now that really hasn't hit the, main, uh, the, main, the mainstream. Uh, let me just sort of mention maybe uh, uh, a couple. Uh, we can only go so far with taxes and transfers. We have to worry about uh, mar uh, 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 mar market uh, outcomes and how the market works, and uh, ultimately with the distribution of, of wealth. So there's a lot of discussion on uh, about a, a basic income. Mm -hmm. And um, I sort of, in principle, sort of agree with that. It's going to give people a certain floor, um, but in many models, this is sort of like an unconditional floor. You don't have to work for it. I think it's important to keep people engaged in the labor market, but you could imagine them being engaged so that they're not only paid a market wage, but also a social wage. So there are significant subsidies uh, combined with a strong minimum wage uh, to people at the in, the in the lower part of the income distribution. Th their wages uh, uh, get topped up. And we, we have some nascent programs uh, like that on the books uh, al already. 
Uh, so this is where I was sort of getting back. You don't have to be radical or alarmist. You just sort of find the, the part of your body politic that is working and work on that muscle and mm -hmm. let the other f structures sort of become vestigial, <laughs> uh, yeah. if I can use that silly <laughs> metaphor. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, there is that sort of um, uh, uh, wage subsidies at the lower end um, and a type of conditional uh, basic uh, income. Uh, we're already sort of seeing, unfortunately, people dropping out, you know, um, Labor force participation rates amongst men falling, opioid epidemics in some parts of the country, mm -hmm. uh, and and this is all I think related to you know what's going on. Sure. Okay. And then the, the final thing that we should worry about, and this is where there's some creative thinking going on, is ultimately in the end uh, the wealth distribution. So economists make a distinction between income and wealth. So income is sort of uh, you know you turn on the the bath water and it's that flow. Okay, and and wealth is a stock. It's like how high the bath water is after you turn the tap off. And in the end, wealth is really important. It's important at a personal level um, because it gives me agency. It helps me uh, smooth my consumption. Uh, when I get hit with a negative shock, a, a layoff or something, I know I've got a buffer. Uh, it helps me uh, to plan. Um, it gives me also a capacity, uh, obviously, to save for my retirement and also to pass something on to my kids. Mm -hmm. All right? But wealth also allows me to influence other people and influence the political story. So if wealth gets so concentrated, and again, this is why I sort of point to the United States as ground zero, because it's sort of well documented how the political process right. tends to favor the more wealthy uh, uh, there. Um, then we're sort of, you know, we go down a path that's going to take us somewhere else than um, serving the needs of all, all citizens. So some analysts are sort of trying to imagine how you can influence the wealth distribution. So, for mm -hmm. example, um, there are existing examples of sovereign wealth funds. Um, the state of Alaska, some decades ago, uh, decided to share with each citizen the royalties from uh, natural resource exploitation. Okay, uh, Norway does the same thing. Yeah, so in Alaska, you get a check. <laughs> right. You know, uh, so this is sort of a, a way of collectivizing and sharing the wealth. Norway does a, sim a similar thing with its uh, oil and gas uh, uh, revenues uh, with a collective uh, 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 fund. Which I think is worth over a trillion dollars. Well, now, well this is it. But, but the point is that that wealth is not getting concentrated in, in the hands of the 1%. It's a, right. it's a collective one. And so we can imagine sort of other sources for this. I, and where would we get those sources that we would all share? Okay? This is a whole new and exciting world we were talking about, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. It's a data-driven world. Mm -hmm. Who owns the data? What kind of contract are we setting up? Uh, you know, I, I gave you permission to use my data. What's the payback? Right. right. Maybe, maybe there's a collective aspect to data. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's an oil that we can collectively well, use. And the economist has spent a lot of ink on this issue of data and having data rights and that the future may be for every individual to be a data worker. I mean, the, the, the ecosystem that we live in now with Apple, Google, Facebook, Spotify, whatever it is, is data driven. We, we may not recognize or appreciate that in our day-to-day -day lives, but we are not the clients or the consumers of Facebook. We are the products of it. The clients are the people who buy advertisement. And so therefore, should we not be uh, compensated for our data. Well, that's this is where I'm going. So maybe this is the, sort of the new oil that mm -hmm. could be p a part of a collective wealth. Um, financial transactions are a big part of this way this globalized world uh, works. And there's always been talk about a financial transaction uh, uh, tax. These obviously are solutions at a, at a global level too. But there is wealth being created by some of those instruments. We're part of it. But how do we write that contract so that we all share in that wealth in an inclusive way? So right. there's a lot of interesting thinking going on. It doesn't have to be alarmist. It doesn't have to be radical. It, it builds upon what, uh, 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 what we know. Um, and, and slowly these things percolate into the political sphere and are talked about more and more. 
um, uh, you know, uh, the basic income idea has come and gone uh, since, you know, for decades, um, and some parts of it are actually instituted. So in Canada, I think it's reasonable say to say we have uh, a basic income for families with children. Right. So it's, you know, uh, it's not out of reason to imagine these things happening. Uh, y you know, you, you don't have to be alarmist or radical. So I'm just going to ask the question from, from the totally the other side for the, for the last couple minutes that we have. Um, someone who is an avid believer and follower in Ayn Rand or Milton Friedman would ask right now, aren't you just talking about overreaching uh, government intervention, the redistribution of wealth to something that should just be let alone? Uh, should this transition, in other words, be managed by individual human beings on their own, dealing with their own problems uh, and let, let them stay out of the way? Otherwise, does government intervention not make things th these things worse and eventually lead to the problems, these catastrophes that I was referring to earlier? Is, there, is that even a proper argument anymore? Well, or? look, I don't think it's constructive to go to huge extremes. Uh, you know, of course, we, ha we are all believers in, in the market. All right, uh, and and the, and the role uh, of uh, government in that view is certainly to establish property li property rights, and and, and 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 let individuals pursue their own interests. Abs you know, absolutely. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Like, come on. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're talking to an economist here. Yeah. yeah. Like, 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 come on. But at the same time, we don't have to believe that there aren't market failures. I mean, the classic one is uh, is um, uh, global warming and, p and pollution. Like the market solution to that is to put a price on something yeah. so that individuals can make rational choices that collectively lead to an optimum. To internalize the external. Exactly. So, so if we believe in markets, um, we, we also have to be objective and also believe that there are, are market f uh, uh, failures. The second thing is market outcomes are determined in the beginning by the initial distribution of property rights. So if you start off with a situation in which there is extreme inequality in initial uh, property rights, the solution the market finds is conditional on that. Right. If you start, you're going to reach another market equilibrium just as efficient, just as optimal if the initial distribution of property rights was more equal. Mm. All right. And we live in this sort of dynamic and growing economy. And so we have to recognize that we're always negotiating and renegotiating <laughs> those uh, uh, property rights uh, as the nature of, um, uh, of our economy changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is, we don't live in the kind of world you described. We live in, in a world that um, is bounded by norms and institutions. And, and there are a whole host of market economies uh, right now in which people are equally free to pursue their own uh, interests, and yet they have tremendously different social uh, outcomes in mm -hmm. terms of education and health and other the core determinants of happiness mm -hmm. all right that uh, there's, there's just a wide band in there that we can mm -hmm. choose uh, from and, and, and that's that's the art of constructing our institutions mm -hmm. and our public policy which is ultimately a social uh, choice well and I think that most barriers are not written down in a law nor are they uh, formalized in, in in the physical wall most barriers are social Right. I mean. Yeah, but 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 or maybe another way, just to finish this thought, a way of putting it, uh, the market is not an uh, an outcome we should seek. It's a means to an outcome. Yeah. That, w and we need the market to help us get there efficiently and sustainably. Uh, but we have to recognize uh, how to steer it to the outcomes collectively we want. Which is perhaps the the, the philosophical. Uh, problem with Ayn Rand and Milton Friedman is that they would argue that the market is in and of itself a, a grand um, ideal to it to achieve or aspire to uh, I'm not sure I put Friedman in in that uh, uh, box I mean he was a great economist right. too uh, 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 um, but you do see in discourse that flipping where where the means become the end right <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Korak, this has been a tremendous conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time. Well, thank you. It's been a real pleasure, Ben. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
All right, your quote of the week is from the former chair of the United States Federal Reserve, or the Fed, Alan Greenspan. Now, what's important about this quote is not just what it says, but where it comes from. The Fed was and remains to this day one of the most important institutions of the global economic order, and Greenspan was its chair from 1986 to 2006, a time when the United States was in the ascendant and after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, the only remaining superpower. But more than that, consider Greenspan's philosophical roots. He was a key disciple of Ayn Rand, someone you wouldn't think would care much about income inequality. But here's what Greenspan said in 2014. I consider income inequality the most dangerous part of what's going on in the United States. Thanks for listening.